Behind every fact is a face. Behind every statistic is a story. Behind every catchphrase is a young person whose future will be lost if something is not done immediately to change his or her reality. And when it comes to young African American youth, the numbers are staggering and the reality is sobering. This quote is taken from Tamika Thompson. She's an educator who is really invested in improving, in improving the lives of African American young folks in the inner city. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jamal Haley. Um, I am the Director of Programs for the Star Trek Adolescent HIV Program at the University of Maryland. Our program is located within the Department of Pediatrics from the School of Medicine at the University of Maryland. Um, I am also an African American University uh, Fellow, 2003 Fellow, 2013 Fellow, I'm sorry, 2013 Fellow at the Black, with the Black Asian Institute. Um, before we move forward, I am going to um, actually play a clip of a little video just so you all can get a little flavor about what it's like for young people to live in Baltimore. you saw there um, were um, young men participating in um, dirt bike riding. That's something that's really big in Baltimore. And that actually was a dirt bike game uh, called the 12 O'Clock Boys. Um, if anyone's interested, there's a, DVD, there's a DVD out about them, which the clip is from. It's called the 12 O'Clock uh, Boys. Um, biker, bank, um, biker game, not like they don't really engage in it uh, illegal so much, except for riding like dirt bikes. But you know, they don't do the selling of drugs and bikes. Um, <laughs> so, that, um, so I just wanted you all to get a little sense. I know some people may not have uh, been familiar with Baltimore, may not have went to Baltimore, but that's kind of like what it's like being a particularly young black uh, man in Baltimore. So um, Baltimore, um, you, you've all heard me tell you before, Baltimore is home of uh, jazz music um, and uh, the chicken box and blue crabs and everything that's all wonderful and good. Um, Baltimore has approximately um, 600,021, I'm nervous, y'all, so you have to That's give me a second. We love you, Jamal. Thank you. 621,342 uh, people living there. Um, the majority of the population is female, just a little over um, 50%. Um, in Baltimore, um, most of the people living there are black. Um, and these numbers are from uh, 2000. That estimates from 2012, but these numbers down here um, are from, I believe, 2011. So I think it actually went up. I think Baltimore is like closer to a little over 64% uh, African American. Uh, the graduation rate is um, about 80%. Um, those with a bachelor's degree um, are a little over 25%. That's the median income. Um, and that's the number of people who live below poverty. You can see how it compares to Morrison, uh, to Maryland, specifically with um, regards to race. Um, like in Maryland, 30% of the people living there are black, um, compared to Baltimore, where it's approximately 64%. Um, what's really interesting about this is that Baltimore has um, tons of um, higher education uh, schools there. So there are a number of colleges, um, two historically black colleges, 
and like I want to say four, five, six other colleges in the local area. Uh, despite that, only well, roughly 26, close to 26 percent actually have a bachelor's degree. Um, so that should just let you know something about the state of the people in Baltimore in terms of where, where they are, where they're, where they're living, and what they have access to. Um, so, in terms of HIV, um, as you can see, um, these are the uh, cases, number of reported uh, cases of uh, HIV, um, and these come from 2010. Uh, recently, they updated that um, that information. I don't have those numbers today, um, but I would definitely be able to forward them to BAI so they can send them out so that folks know um, what the updated numbers are in Baltimore. Um, as of 2010, these are the number of people living with HIV without AIDS, and these are the people um, living uh, with HIV with HIV with AIDS diagnosis. Um, that's the total number of people living with HIV in Baltimore. And you can see how that compares to the rest of Maryland. In Baltimore, um, the num once again, this, these numbers are from 2010. Um, I think the, the, the updated ones come from 2012. Um, and I'll be able to share those. Like I said, I will be actually looking forward those out. Um, but this is the number of new cases of 2010. Um, uh, new, new cases. Um, Black Americans, black Baltimoreans made up 86% of the number of new cases of HIV in Baltimore in 2010. Um, and of the number of people uh, living with uh, HIV in 2010, 24% um, of new cases, 24%, uh, no 24% um, came from uh, drug users, 32% um, came from human sex with men, and 35.3% um, or heterosexual. So despite the national averages and national um, data say, uh, showing that there is this uh, pandemic happening among uh, black uh, uh, men, um, black gay men and, and across the country, in Baltimore, um, there's still a large number of um, people who are getting HIV through heterosexual contact. Um, so that's important as we talk about planning uh, activities and uh, programming for BTAN, um, making sure that we're meeting the goals of the epidemic and not necessarily just follow national trends because that's where the money is. Um, and, um, but with that in mind, while um, MSM only accounted for 32.4% of new cases, this is the only exposure category that saw an increase. So um, all other exposure categories um, saw a decrease um, in 2010. So I drug use, um, heterosexuals, um, uh, uh, yeah, all of the um, categories saw a decrease. The only increase um, was saw among um, MSM populations. In the third study of the third cycle of the our national um, surveillance study, our part is called the Beach Shore. But in the, in, the, in the third cycle of the um, of the surveillance study, um, there was an HIV prevalence rate of 42 percent, um, with 67.3 percent unaware of their diagnosis and that that's that's why um, this is something about people not getting tested in Baltimore and people not knowing about where they can get tested and access services um, really quickly we're going to do a quick activity um, so everyone um, if you can feel under your chair you should have a piece of paper under there <laughs> So you all can grab it. Okay. Paper. I have a paper. Do you have this paper? You sure. I have it. On the front of it? Check the front. Oh, wait. Okay. You have it? Oh. Okay. If everyone can stand up. Okay. Um, so, does everyone have a piece of paper? No. No? Okay. You can have mom. <laughs> 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 oh, thank you. Oh, Danny, you're your face. Everyone has a piece of paper? <laughs> okay, if everyone can open up their piece of paper. How many people have nothing on their um, piece of paper? How many people have a sticker? Okay. In Baltimore, the people with stickers, that represents the number of 
uh, black MSM who are living with HIV. Wow. So approximately one in three black MSM are actually living with HIV in Baltimore. Um, so that's why even though heterosexuals still represent a, um, a high number of the new cases, we have to pay attention to uh, what's going on with uh, black MSM population because that population is seeing an increase um, in HIV. Um, it's largely due to um, the, uh, the, the population being neglected for so long. Um, over the past, I want to say, three years, um, organizations in Baltimore finally started paying attention. Y'all can't see, I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 finally started paying attention. <laughs> 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 yeah, so um, so about like, I want to say, so over the last three years, organizations have finally started paying attention to um, black and African populations so over so long. All of the resources and all of the dollars were going to um, high risk heterosexual black women. Um, in that time, um, the epidemic amongst the population was going up. Um, and that's important to note because we don't want the reverse to happen. As we focus our attention and our dollars towards MSM, we don't want to have a situation where now we're seeing another increase in black women. So that's just something that we should definitely keep in mind as we think about doing our work. And I'm going to move one more time. I'm sorry. Alright. Okay, so the needs assessment. Um, the needs assessment was actually com uh, compiled from different data sources. Um, in 2013, um, the Greater Baltimore HIV Planning uh, Council did a um, survey amongst Ryan White clinics. The survey, um, its purpose was to identify the unmet needs of people living with HIV. Um, and um, unfortunately, like we left out a segment of the population because we weren't able to get the people who were um, HIV positive and not in care. But this was the HIV, this information came from people who were HIV positive and in care. But so that's what that's what one data source. The second data source came from um, the Department of Mental Health and Hygiene. Um, they just released a report two weeks ago, three weeks ago, three weeks ago, um, specifically on um, HIV among um, Black same gender loving men. And so that is for the needs assessment. Um, so that, that's the second source of information that um, I use to come up with um, uh, to collect information about the needs assessment and do the gap analysis. Um, one of the things that was highlighted in terms of what's missing is um, lack of housing. Um, that's a big thing in Baltimore, in Baltimore um, which is really odd. We um, just got into a big, big little situation, both big little situation, right? Um, a huge situation with the um, federal government. Um, HUD um, sent a lot of money um, to Baltimore for housing. Um, and unfortunately, um, that money was not used in the most appropriate way. Um, so we're experiencing a situation where now federal dollars are being taken away from Baltimore City because um, the federal government is um, questioning whether or not we even need the money, considering um, the money wasn't used for what it's supposed to be used for. Um, this, isn't, this isn't unique to Baltimore. I think um, Herman, correct me if I'm wrong, in DC, they just experienced the same thing where I think like a, one of the major um, programs there uh, used HUD money to like uh, fund a strip club. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, that's something that happens throughout the country, but um, that's, that's definitely <laughs> happens to Baltimore. Yeah. Um, and then the lack of uh, EFA stands for emergency, emergency financial assistance. Um, this is usually used to pay for things such as um, uh, uh, for for Ryan White for um, like um, eviction permission and to make sure people's um, uh, beginning this Baltimore gas electric doesn't get cut off. Um, so there's definitely a lack of that to people um, living with HIV. And then a lack of medical transportation. Um, that was something that uh, we, we found that people still had major problems getting to their medical appointments. Um, that's due to two reasons. One, um, we have a really crappy um, transportation system, like medical transportation system. Um, the, our Medicaid uh, folks always show up late. Um, and it takes a lot to be able to qualify to get uh, medical transportation. So that, that's, that's something that's really tough. Um, and then the other thing is that people don't know how to apply for medical transportation. Um, even though people have access to case managers and social workers, um, something is still like a mystery about how to access services, a lot of services. It's actually one of the things that was um, noted in the um, Greater Baltimore HIV Planning Council's 
uh, consumer survey is that we have all these wonderful services happening in Baltimore, but no one knows how to get to them or access them. Um, so that lets us know, particularly lets me know for BTAS that we need to do a lot more um, in educating people about the services and how to access them. Um, so um, I'll go forward and come back. So um, in a gap analysis, um, one of the things that we uh, saw is that there uh, is a lack of trauma-informed mental health programs. Um, in Baltimore, but it's probably in a lot of major cities, um, there are a number of um, people who experience some form of trauma. And we don't do a good job, I say we, I mean um, providers, because I actually am a um, provider in Baltimore. We don't do a good, a good enough job in actually screening people, or screening, assessing people for um, trauma when they come into our um, clinics. Um, and that shows in terms of whether or not people remain engaged, how often they come to their appointments, and it shows up in some kind of the, uh, the adherence to uh, medication. Um, there's also a lack of evidence-based mental health uh, treatment interventions being used in Baltimore. People kind of uh, do their own thing, like, oh, this works for my clinic, so I'm just gonna do this. Um, not taking into, take into consideration that there are a number of interventions that have been developed by um, SAMHSA that specifically address mental health problems. But often, people, because there's no um, necessary incentive to get trained on these interventions, providers don't. Uh, providers kind of have the option of like doing their own thing because they build independently. And then, most important, there's a lack of um, transition to adult care clinics. Um, there are a number of young people um, living with HIV who have special needs. Um, we deal with two specific populations when we come to adolescents um, who are transitioning to adult care. One is folks who um, believe behaviorally acquired HIV, um, and two are folks who um, uh, perinatally acquired uh, HIV. And that perinatal population is really unique and really special, and often what happens is that when they're ready to transition, adult care providers aren't ready to receive them. Um, things such as treatment fatigue, or in some cases, um, you, you're, we're seeing uh, chronic medical conditions that you would not typically see in young people and folks living with HIV because they've had it since birth. And also, um, brain development's been affected, um, particularly with um, the frontal lobe. So you'll have a lot of um, young adults who are super impulsive and providers just saying, oh, you're young, grow up. Um, and really, it's not about them growing up. They, their frontal lobe is messed up. Like they're, they're, they're not willingly being impulsive. It's like something that they can't control. Um, but provided, but adult providers often don't take that consideration. So when um, they encounter young people, oh, sooky, sooky now. <laughs> Time to go. It's a ghost of fellows all right, so um, we're going to head back to um, the But in terms of resources, so despite all these things I've mentioned about Baltimore, Baltimore is actually a rich city in terms of resources. Um, we are lucky enough to have um, two clinics that are specifically for adolescents and young adults. Um, one is the Harriet Lane Clinic at John Hopkins, the other is the Adolescent Young Adult Center at the University of Maryland. There are also other um, centers. Um, FQHCs that have adolescent programs, such as Healthy for Homeless um, and um, Total Healthcare. Um, we have tons and tons of adult HIV uh, healthcare clinics. There's at least 15. Um, so people, it's not like people don't have anywhere to go. Um, it's really about the, the environment that um, some of the clinics create. Uh, for people that make them not go there, and often people not know enough about HIV. Um, and then, despite the fact that there have been tons of cuts in HIV prevention money, um, programs in Baltimore still have found a way to survive, and there are tons of HIV prevention programs. We're also lucky enough to have um, the Center for AIDS research uh, locally in Baltimore. It's at John Hopkins University, and we have like at least a dozen community planning groups around HIV. Okay, so the Black Treatment Advocates Network. 
Um, the mission is, um, is to increase uh, science and treatment literacy to run in HIV in black communities. The goal is to legally obtain people living with HIV, uh, to care and treatment, and increase the enrollment into clinical trials and improve access to quality care and prevention and effort to get HIV down to zero. Um, there are a couple of VTANs uh, throughout the country. Um, we would have one in Kingston. Hey, come on. Um, and that is one of the, the newer ones. Um, you can see though, if it's kind of hard to see, but the cities in red are the newer cities, and the cities in black are the more established ones. Okay, so D10 Baltimore. Um, problem statement. HIV continues to be an issue in Baltimore due to a lack of coordinated HIV programs. Uh, this is skewed by a dearth of mental health programs that target the needs of black people that are in trauma form in other space. In order to combat HIV rates in Baltimore, there needs to be an increase in the number of providers who use evidence-based mental health services that are trauma-informed. Um, yay, we can't part of it. You know, a couple of trailers and everything. It's cute, it's cute. <laughs> okay, so, um, that was a little off. Okay, so um, that's not a place so I'll go and then come back. Okay, so, the treatment education. Um, ignore the titles because that's not my strong point, but we'll play along. Um, so um, the title of the program is Project Health Plus. Um, it's to train um, providers of um, issues unique to black persons living with or uh, living with HIV or risk for HIV. The um, target population will be um, mental health providers and substance providers in the No Wrong Door Network in Baltimore. No Wrong Door is a program um, run by the state uh, health department. The program um, targets mental health um, providers, substance providers, and one infectious disease provider, which is the University of Maryland. Um, the goal is to um, be able to link people to um, infectious disease services, mental health services, or substance abuse services, no matter which sphere they come in. So if someone wants to come through a substance abuse program, they will be able to get direct referrals and linkage to um, health care or to mental health services. Um, so that's what's unique and cool about that program. The other thing is that it's really looking at um, sexual health and looking at um, sex and substance abuse and recovery and looking at the link between sex um, and drug usage um, and trying to do something different about that. Because um, as we know, there's substance abuse is um, often linked to sex. And some, for some people, sex can be a trigger for substance abuse, um, for substance usage. So that, we want to get in there and work with those providers initially. Um, in terms of patient navigation, Helping hands will um, improve the number of black people receiving care in Baltimore by developing a linkage to care protocol for teens and young adults. There is still not a um, standardized uh, way to link young people to care. Um, this population is really unique, as I mentioned before, and needs a lot of supportive services. Um, and the idea is to um, find six providers who do linkage to care and kind of uh, train them on this protocol. Um, and then uh, in terms of disclosure, it's the other uh, part of the area um, is to work with um, Runway Part A, B, and C non kids management uh, staff and coaching folks on how to disclose um, their HIV status. Um, yeah, so target population, of course, the case managers in those programs. Um, and then the, in terms of advocacy, um, we would like to uh, train about 40 youth um, on how to lobby for policy change um, regarding um, the mental health needs of black people living with HIV AIDS. And the target population is used in Baltimore. Now, um, something you may notice is that except for advocacy, all of the treatment uh, services so far are targeting providers. Um, that is strategic in uh, B10 Baltimore's purpose. Um, our thought to that, we do not want to spend all this time working with uh, educating all these people about HIV and the importance of being in care and the importance of adherence, only to have them go to providers who aren't able to provide services to them because they aren't competent. Because um, what that will do is um, have long-term implications that um, will create a ripple effect. So if people are going to providers where they don't feel comfortable, they're going to leave. Um, and then if we train the providers after they're gone, we're going to have to work probably 50 times harder to get them to go back to those places where they received care that wasn't uh, substantial. So um, our goal is to do a two-phased approach. One, focusing on providers, making sure providers are ready to receive people. And then two, um, second phase to um, actually work more direct with the community to 
get them more knowledgeable about care and caring. So when they go to these places, the police are ready to receive them and they can rock and roll. All right, so this is the BTAN logic model. Um, we have all seen this several times. We are all familiar with this. Um, we should be, we're familiar with this, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, the major thing is the, um, what this logic model um, is intended uh, impact. So the impact is increased viral suppression among black people living with HIV, decreased viral load in black communities, and increased participation in clinical trials. Um, these are objectives and activities and outputs and um, outcomes, which we all know what that is from the wonderful training we received um, here in this fellowship. Um, so, um, but each of our, the Dr. Pro's programs with the activities we think strongly will end up leading to this. Like I said, by um, working with the providers first, we think we'll create the environment where the impacts um, can be successful. Make sense, follow me? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Mm -hmm. All right, people look tired. <laughs> people look distracted. So that means we have to do another activity. All right then. All right, so people stand up. Let's do it. All right, people. So, part of what we're talking about is um, actually training the, actually training providers to be able to receive people and work with people. Um, in terms of that, um, providers have to be able to, be able to have conversations with people, um, no matter what they're saying, and not have any type of reaction. This activity we're about to do is going to kind of Prepare for all that. Is it? Y'all ready? ready? Okay. So everyone has someone. Just, no, you're not ready. Daniel, don't look around. Yeah. Oh you my know, God. You know, I'm gonna call you up. Um, so, so everyone should get a partner. The person. Okay. 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 You're stuck with me then. Okay. So, what you gonna? Yeah. Is, is, is it an odd number with people? Yeah. 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 What you're gonna do is gonna turn to your partner, stare deeply into their eyes. <laughs> now, the goal, the goal is to um, not have a reaction to what the person is saying. So, we're gonna have one person as the provider, one person as the patient. Doesn't matter, um, but patients. I want you all to see the most outrageous, ridiculous, gutter butt nasty stuff you can think of. And the goal of the <laughs> provider is not to react. Not to giggle. Um, um, we're going to do it like, do we switch? Do we switch? Do we switch? One at a time. One at a time. I mean, the whole group going all at once, but one. No, no, no. We're going to do groups. We're going to do groups. And each one's going to have a chance to. So everybody's listening to everybody else. Yep. Okay. Oh, that's all. 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 Additional activity, so we're all going to take time, take turns. So the group will be able to hear what you're saying, um, and we'll be able to look at you and see you act this out, and then we're going to be able to switch so each person has a chance to act it out. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So we're going to start with my, to my left. Oh, no. Yep, one around the circle. This is what when we get bored, right? <laughs> Rebecca. Okay, so I'm here because I need um, a test for something. I peed today and it was burning, and I don't know what that means. And it was like red and kind of like orange color. So, what do you think I should do about that? No, no, no. The whole point is not to respond. You reacted. Okay? You reacted. The whole point is not to respond. Okay, um, Ashley, that you say something to Rebecca. You're the patient now. Come on, Ashley. Oh, go, Ash. Um. I'm really sorry I came here um, and 
I am a heterosexual female, but um, I uh, act in homosexual ways sometimes, and I don't know why. <laughs> So this morning I had like sex back to back with like four different people. They don't know each other. Two of them were together. But um yeah. Okay. What advice do you have? Okay, switch. Um, so I went to the club and I met out with this guy, even though he had like this massive like sore on his head. And then he was just so fine, I can't get over it. Then we went to the bathroom and one thing went to another. <laughs> oh, here it goes. Alright, next group. Next group. So I'm just gonna keep it real, real with you. I woke up and my vagina was on fire. <laughs> so. Good Herman, good Herman. Right. <laughs> I'm used to it. Right. <laughs> okay, so my turn. I just did. Okay. <laughs> so right, um, last night I had put my thing in something and it got stuck, and now it's a sore. But then I had sex this morning. I didn't use no protection. And it got stuck again. But it wasn't with a female or a male. Oh, actually. <laughs> 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 So um, uh, the network was formed at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. Um, honestly, uh, it was informed because it was formed because people love me. Um, I've been doing a lot of work in Baltimore for quite some time, um, and often I've been the only person, um, only black man, um, in the room um, demanding uh, equal access for young gay men and women of color. Woo! So um, people are excited about um, B10. People are excited about me. So they just came because I said this stuff. Um, but what's interesting is that for the most part, the more seasoned people chose to not come. Um, I have been, my B10 is predominantly made of people who are young, who are new to the field. Um, I think they're probably only three of us who are over the age of 30. Um, everyone else is young, excited, and super um, ready to uh, engage in this work. We do have uh, two more seasoned people who are definitely ready to pass the torch and uh, help train these, this younger generation to be the new voice for HIV treatment and prevention. Um, who are your members and why were they recruited? Um, the community state holders, and at this point, they're all providers. Some are consumers and providers, but for the most part, they're providers. Um, and I did it that way because I, I, I wanted to first get um, people who are familiar with HIV inside the room before we branch out. Okay, the new opportunities and challenges arise. Yes. Like I said, the last three years, um, Baltimore's been doing a lot around HIV. Uh, what that's done is that people are now confused about what's happening with Baltimore. Um, and organizations have changed names, like our organization, Black Pride, has become the Center for Black Equity Baltimore. Um, and so that confuses people when they hear B10. They're like, are you with them? Are you not with them? Are you University of Maryland program? Are you not? So there's some confusion about what B10 is, um, which has cost some people very few to get a little territorial and not want to work with B10, but I won them over because I'm a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here are my community partners so far. Um, Life Health and Wellness. Life Health and Wellness is a CBO that primarily, primarily works with women and children. Women respecting, a woman accepting responsibility is an organization that primarily works with women of color. Um, this includes transgender women, Department of Mental Health and Hygiene, super supportive and really excited about working with uh, B10. Health for the Homeless, Gilead Sciences, uh, Compass at University, Baltimore Crisis Response. 
Um, currently, um, we're in the process of determining what traditional black institutions to invite to the table. We did a huge push before, but we got some resistance because different people are working with different uh, uh, institutions. Civil, social, education, religious. Um, we have had most success in education, engaging Common State University, and engaging Morgan State University. Um, we have Morgan State students who are part of B10 and are really excited, and the you know, Common State University has agreed to do whatever they can to help support B10. Um, we have worked with the NAACP in terms of the civil organization. Um, they, we, we work with them on doing a health education session for young women. Um, it was not so much HIV really about their bodies, but they're excited about B10. They want to work with us more in the future. In terms of social, um, we have uh, the sorority and the deltas. Uh, they're really, really, really excited about uh, B10, and they actually helped us out on Gay Pride. And so did um, the 100 Black Men, the Baltimore location, they came through and helped out on Gay Pride as well, um, as well as the, what are they, Sigmas. They came out and um, social court for B10, so that was really, really cool. Um, and then religious, we're working with um, this organization called uh, uh, Hope Springs, they kind of have um, connections to different uh, churches, and so we're in talk with them to see um, what they think about joining uh, B10 and see if we can get them on board. Okay, so we're still in our really early stages of uh, B10. We're trying to uh, establish leadership. So right now we're focusing on leadership, but in the um, so we're looking to get our co-chair um, in place, and we um, for the next six months we will agree to meet. Um, once a month, um, every third Monday. So on the 14th, we'll have our next meeting, just so we get things a little um, more good job. Awesome, thank you. Um, so day one of our, um, we did our training in a different way. We kind of had a week of trainings. Uh, Rebecca came there, she helped out, she was awesome. Um, and really we focused on um, HIV and how it impacted different how it impacted different uh, service areas. Um, um, which, um, we talk about intersectionality and how HIV uh, uh, impacts, uh, how, H how racism, homophobia, and sexism show up in HIV work. Uh, we talk about how HIV uh, impacts multiple systems. Um, originally we had like 20 more people come, but only 12 people actually completed. Um, the, the amount of time commitment, back to back kind of caused some challenges so people couldn't like take off of work three days and something that training so um yeah but out of that we got some commitments from asos and cbos so that was awesome um training was this would be april 14th and 16th but whatever it was held at Coppin state university like i said 12 people ended up completing it even though we had overall 20 people 21 people come um we got a commitment to actually be a part for, for people who said they want to be a part of BTAN. Um, and we really discussed HIV in the education system. That was probably the most rich, uh, um, what is it, rich conversation um, uh, that took place. We were talking about um, how sex education, how the limited conversation around sex education in the schools impacts HIV transmission. Um, we went through the um, project areas um, and what activities we're doing. The main thing is what we're doing to evaluate it is some protests, pre-test, post-test. Um, we'll do a couple of focus groups and some interviews. Um, we'll do some surveys and then we'll do some document reviews, particularly for the um, patient navigation to see if that protocol is actually doing anything different. Um, some challenges of the, the BCN fellowship, definitely time. Um, didn't last so much time as it's going to require. It says 15 to 20 hours. Give a shout out on that one. But um, <laughs> we're a little more than that. Um, <laughs> workload um, and then consistency um, and funding like. Um, this is pretty much a volunteer thing happened that, that, that we're asking people to do with us. Um, we're not funding people to like leave their jobs to come and work with us, so that, that's a barrier. Success is that we've been able to get um, the AIDS education, AIDS education Training Center in Baltimore to agree to offer CEUs um, for all of our trainings, uh, which is really helpful. Um, in November, October, we'll have um, a day long training for case managers and not AIDS nurses on the science of treatment of HIV. Um, in September, we'll be speaking at um, AMAC, the Association of Nurses on AIDS Care, about um, the prison of HIV pipeline. And Gilead Sciences have offered to help out any way they can, which includes um, providing uh, refreshments and food and also um, guest speakers. 
Next steps, we'll have regular meetings. We're planning this huge event at Copia for National Black HIV AIDS Awareness Day. It's a four day thing we want to do. Um, part of what we want to do is to recognize um, people who, um, black people who were in the fight um, against HIV stigma and transmission early on in the fight that we often don't talk about. So we plan on doing like a photo exhibit just so people know who some of those folks are. Um, and then we plan on doing a traditional uh, a TBI engagement, but like ramping that up and going to meet with people one on one. Um, we'll get the B10 leadership in place um, and then focus on future trainings through the EETC. Um, definitely want to take time out to acknowledge and thank um, Black Jesus to staff. Um, Ronnie's name was up here. That was no site. My bad. No, not in the room. Okay, so I said my bad. Um, <laughs> Phil Wilson, Nisha Clark. Rebecca Israel, uh, Alicia McKinley Beach, um, and definitely Rebecca for coming out and hanging out with my crazy staff. Um, she got to see all the madness that um, I helped create. Um, so yay. Then also Star Trek Adolescent Health uh, Program, my wonderful staff. Um, they are rock stars, and at some point I hope that each and every one of you had a chance to meet them. Um, they are a group of crazy people. They are all very much like me, so um, you'll have some fun. Um, and of course, the University of Maryland, uh, Dean Reese, for allowing me to be a part of this. Dr. Vicki Tepper, my department, our division head, for allowing me to um, come out here for you and participate in this. Um, BTAN Baltimore, our community partners. Um, and of course, you all, Auburn Fellows. Um, definitely recognizing uh, Ms. Lindsay and Cedric for always being amazingly um, helpful, warm, and nice, and friendly. Um, definitely Danielle for her crazy passion, and it's something that's amazing and inspires me even more. And the Fantastic Four. Um, I want to thank them, these three knuckleheads. <laughs> <laughs> Keep on coming back. Um, Herman, Ashley, and Alan, my roommate. Um, thank you all. And big off uh, all the fellows. You all have contributed um, to my growth process. And I now help people. So see, growth. <laughs> <laughs> all right.